Most of the people who watch this channel are unfortunately solo developers. I've talked before about the benefits of working in a team, but this video is aimed at you guys again. And one of the series that I've been trying to get started on this channel is a little book club. And in this episode, I'm gonna be talking about this book, How to Make a Game All by Yourself by Matt Hackett. If you're on social media, you've probably seen of the guy's drawings before. I'll put on some screen right now. But Matt is an artist, he's worked on games as well before, and he wrote this book as well, talking about how to make a game by yourself. So I went through the entire book, I have a whole bunch of thoughts on it, I'm gonna go through it like very high level, and then at the end I'm gonna give a general summary as well of what I think about the book. Of course my goal isn't to spoil the entire book, so if at the end of the video you think like, hey, this does sound interesting, I'll put a link down below, I don't get any money from it, but I think it's a pretty solid book. How does the book work? There are 10 chapters in total that take you from the very start of how do I even get into game development all the way to actually releasing it on Steam. And the first lesson that this book has is that you you should see yourself not as a game developer, not as a game artist, but as a producer. Because this is especially something that really is important if you're a solo developer. Don't worry, this book is also honestly pretty applicable still if you're working in a small team. But if you're a solo developer, you can't put yourself into just one box of I'm the programmer or I'm the artist or I'm the, the accountant guy or whatever. No, you have to do all of that. And we often say like, oh, you have to wear different hats. And Matt's approach here is you don't have to wear any hats because you're going to be the one man army who's going to make this game a reality. What I like here is that he just goes in and he's like, okay, fair enough, you're alone, but you're not on your own. So you still have plenty of tools, you have the internet, you have forums, you have people like me who make videos about the entire game development process as well, who can help you throughout your development process still. Now, this isn't really as applicable anymore, but for example, in software development, there used to be a time where real programmers didn't use things like Stack Overflow. And it was almost like a badge of honor to be able to just know everything yourself. That's a bad approach. You should use tools as often as possible. And I would even extend this to not just tools, but even things like assets. If you're not a 3D artist, just rely on tools for 3D modeling to make it easier or to get simply straight up assets like Sinti or whatever, and just use those in your game. And the same works with programming. You can use frameworks, you can use engines that aren't as code intensive, for example. So really accept that, hey, look, you are going in with a disadvantage. So every single advantage that you can use in making your game, you should use. The next part is finding your itch as a game developer. So this is basically what tickled you to begin with to watch these videos, for example. Why do you want to make your first game? Is it because you have an idea that has never been made before? Or is it because you really like art, like you work as a designer, for example, in a regular boring company and you want to try out something more fun? There's plenty of different reasons why people get into game development, but it's important that you know what that is for you because that's going to dictate the kind of games you're gonna make how you're gonna make those games like if you're gonna have a big focus on for example mechanics or on story if you just want to focus on giving an experience and telling a story to the player but the exact mechanics don't really matter those are important things to know before you get started with game development now Probably not everyone watching this will know why they want to get into game development. Now, I know our audience a bit better. I've made videos about this before, like what's the why of game development. So you can always go and watch that one, but it's basically try out a bunch of stuff as well. What do you like about game development? So maybe try making a little software application just to see if you like coding, then make some pieces of art or try writing a little short story visual novel in something like RenPy to really easily find out which parts of game development do you personally like and do you want to pursue? Next up, he covers the different building blocks that you're going to have in your game. And this is one that, okay, I thought I knew what the title was going to be about, but actually he has a different approach. He doesn't see your game as you have your code, you have your art, you have your music, you have your sound effects and you have your marketing or whatever, and they all stack together to make your game. Instead, he looks at three main categories, three building blocks for a good game. And those are simply the presentation, the input, and the feedback. So the presentation is gonna be what obviously you see, this is the easiest to explain. It's gonna be your art, it's gonna be your music, it's gonna be your sound effects, for example. It's how you as the player will perceive the game. Then next up is the input. So this is, okay, how am I actually controlling my game? Is it a point and click where I just use the mouse? Is it gamepad based? Do I have a lot of UIs that I go through? That's also a very important touching point. And then lastly, it's the feedback. So how do you make this actually fun or rewarding or engaging for the player? And I think what's great about this approach to building blocks is it really works from the perspective of the player. Like your player is not gonna care 
about what engine you use, about what tech framework you use, or how you source your music, things like that. They just care about the presentation and what they feel when they do something in the game. How do they control the game? So having that approach where you really think from the player's perspective, I think can be really interesting as well. Of course, you as the developer are still going to need to deal with the exact programming languages or with the different ways to work with Photoshop or Aceprite or whatever. But this is a really good approach to see what actually matters for the player and what doesn't really matter how complicated or easy you make it for yourself. Speaking of the engine, very easy. I've talked about this plenty of times before. Just try out a whole bunch of them. Don't get focused immediately on, oh no, I need to go Godot or I need to go Unity. I know some people here really hate Unity, but objectively it's still a very powerful engine and it allows you to do a lot of stuff quite quickly. I don't really care at this point what engine you go with. Just try out some of them at first, like making little projects. And then once you find something that tickles your fancy, that you like the workflow, that you like the experience of, just go with that. There's no wrong answer. You can make a great game in any engine. Now, once you have that engine and you know why you want to make games, the question is obviously going to be, what am I going to make? And here also, once again, something that I hadn't thought about before is that there are three main ways to find what game you should make. And the first one is making the game that you personally want to play. Then also we have the game that you want to make. And lastly, the game that you are good at making. So these sound very similar, but they're actually quite different because not all of these approaches are just as feasible. Like the game I want to make is basically Star Citizen 2.0 with an even bigger universe. I'm not gonna be doing that as a solo developer, but the game that I can make is going to be something that's maybe a lot simpler, but has some cool unique aspects still, some cool mechanics in it, or maybe a story that I want to tell. And then lastly, if I would be making a game that I'm good at making, I don't know if I would even be able to make a game to begin with, because I don't have that broad of a range, to be honest. I'm just good at merging different things together and talking about it. So these are some things that you will have to think about, but you have to really focus on what do you want to make versus what can you actually make. Often when you go into your first games, you're going to realize that, oh, actually, this is harder than I thought. Things that would normally be very easy in traditional development, for example, such as interfaces like buttons and whatever, if you're used to making websites as a web developer, doing that in an engine is suddenly a whole different level of pain because it's just a lot slower and there's a lot more moving parts linked to that interface. So this is something that you will just have to learn through experience. And also you have to remember that at certain points, you will hate your game. I can guarantee you that. You can make the game of your dreams, but at some points, I will promise you, there will be downs where you don't really want to work that much on your game anymore. And this is normal. And I believe you should be able to get through that if you make a game that is a good blend of, I actually want to make this and I'm able to make this and I want to make this. So keep those three things in mind. Make like a little matrix of whatever game idea you have and be like, I want to make this 10 out of 10 because I really like this idea, but I can't really technically make this or I'm not actually the best person at making this. Next up is finding the fun. This is something that I've talked about as well is once you start working on your game, you need to find the fun as fast as possible. And this is going to be hard, but some key indicators could be if you as a developer actually like to play your game. This is going to sound weird, but not every developer likes to play the game that they're making because they just know everything about it. For example, with Forge Industry, since I added every single item, I know what works exactly. And I still like the game, but some of the other developers on our team weren't really the biggest fan of it. Some other ways to find out is your game fun, yes or no, is to see if you can time yourself just playing the game, if you just find yourself getting lost in it, like you were just gonna try out some quick new mechanic and then suddenly 15 minutes or something have passed and you are like, hey, actually, I really like this. That's also a really good indicator or for example, you're working on a mechanic and suddenly everything clicks. Matt calls this the Eureka moment where there's like this one little piece of the puzzle that you add still to your game. Maybe it's like a dashing mechanic in a game that previously didn't have a dash and suddenly it feels amazing. It feels really nice. We had this a bit with Songs of Evergate where people didn't know that you could dash. And then once we told them like, hey, actually, you know, you can dash and you have like iframes when you dash. That's when they realized like, oh shit, this is actually a fun game to play now. That's also a great indicator. Now, one thing that I want you to keep in mind here is that visuals do matter, like as part of that presentation layer in making your game fun. A game that's beautiful to look at 
is automatically going to be a bit more fun than just looking at gray boxes on the screen. So I think you definitely need to cut some slack to yourself and be like, okay, I don't expect perfection from this play test, but just find that little bit of, hey, there is promise in this. I think if I would have actually made pretty graphics for it, this would be great already. So many developers like spend too much time on getting the art on first and then find out that, hey, the game isn't fun to begin with. I think it's better to find something that is moderately fun to play even when it's ugly and then only focus on making it prettier. I found Songs of Average 8 already quite fun to play with when it was very ugly and it was just using stock assets and there was no sound, no sound effects, no music. And because of that, I knew that, okay, once we add some sound effects, once we add some more VFX, some animations, then it's going to really pop. And in my opinion, that has happened. And the next topic he has is managing scope. I'm gonna be very quick here. This is a giant topic. Matt mentioned some really good ways to deal with like large scopes here, but the video I uploaded last Tuesday, which you can find here, also goes more in depth about it. But to very quickly summarize that, write down your original game idea, make an anti-feature list of things that you know that you are never going to put into your game to prevent scope creep, and then also have dedicated points throughout your development cycle where you look at all of the things you have, all of the features that you have planned, and just kill a bunch of them because they're not part of your core game in the end. Next up is having a good experience. And I'm gonna be honest, we are not great at making good experiences for our users yet. So UX is how do they feel the game? Like, is it easy to operate? Is everything they do smooth and does it make sense? Forge Industry was horrible at it. For example, our tutorial when we first launched the game was way too complex already for someone who was just getting into the game. It was like painfully, stupidly simple, the first three steps. And then after like 60 seconds of tutorial, you were suddenly like just dumped into the deep end and still uncertain of what to do. So we lost a lot of our players on that tutorial already. Some other examples of what wasn't good at Forge Industry was that our game flow, so it was a very UI driven game, there were too many clicks you needed to do to perform very simple tasks. Like you need to open menus, select different buildings. Throughout playtesting and throughout some quality of life updates, we did manage to improve that. So now we went from like four clicks to make a route to just two. That's another great example of UX. Now, this chapter goes in very deep into it, talks about some other things such as controls, not being too overwhelming for your player. Like the moment they start the game, they have 17 different UI elements all flashing at them. If you're making a strategy game, don't do that. Or how you add more feedbacks to your game. So whatever they do feels more weighty. A very big mistake, once again, with Forge Industry was that our UI interface barely had any audio feedback. Only when you clicked on like one specific button to like create a route, that's when you got a little sound effect. But honestly, every time the player clicked, there should have been some sound effect. And then once you're working on your game, it's just a matter of iterating. If you're into like agile, it's basically having milestones and sprints and keep working on your game, keep improving it, go and look back at some older first mechanics that you made and be like, okay, actually, do these still hold up? Or maybe some first tutorials you made, some first levels that now that you've gotten better at it, maybe you can just change and improve by completely overhauling them or doing some more playtesting, tweaking some more values. Just keep playing your game and keep finding ways to make it better. And one thing that I personally want to add here is always have a playable build. Don't kill entire parts of your game, like nine months in development where you're like, hey, actually, I wanna completely rework this development because once you have a game that's already working and then you start like reworking certain mechanics and it becomes literally unplayable again, it's going to be very heavy on you as a developer mentally because you're so used to having made that progress of actually having made part of a game already and being able to play something and then suddenly not being able to do that anymore can be really crushing for you. And once again, it's going to lead to one of those points where you hate your development and it will be extremely demotivating. So instead, try to program the mechanics simultaneously so you can just switch once you have a new implementation or a new level, for example, but always have something that is playable of your game. Have like a latest build. You don't have to overcomplicate it with like CI, CD pipelines that like every night then a build automatically gets made. I know you guys like love DevOps for some reason. Just make it so that your master branch, if you're using something like Git, always is playable. And then his last chapter talks about shipping a game, getting it out there on Steam, 
how to make a little main capsule, what to put in your Steam description, and just get the game out as fast as you like can while still having a game, because know that by making more stuff, you're just going to get better. This is something that I very much agree with as well. Just ship games, don't spend multiple years on developing your first game, because you're going to learn a lot more by just quickly iterating over making multiple games, trying out some different genres, what vibes with you, what is something that, you know, actually I don't like to make this kind of game at all. So, what are my thoughts? I generally like the book. I personally, there were chapters where I basically just breezed through because I already knew like where the producer had wasn't that applicable for me, for example, and I have already released a first game. Now, especially as parts like scope creep and things like the user experience did teach me a bunch of extra stuff, so I do like that. There was, however, one big gripe I had with this book, and that is that marketing is only mentioned as like one page on like page 190 or whatever of the last chapter of shipping your game. I believe that this book is great if you just want to make a game, but when it comes to marketing a game and actually selling it, there are some things that don't get covered in here. Like for example, there should be almost a section dedicated to marketing somewhere in the middle already. Once you have that something that is somewhat playable, you should already start looking into things like getting a Steam page up, making a demo of your game or doing actual playtest through like Steam playtest or whatever, just so you can get that ball rolling, posting GIFs on Reddit or wherever else, just so you can get some more traction and do like the whole wishlist game. This is really just, I want to make a game for fun, but not I want to make a game for profit. And that's fine for a lot of developers. A lot of you guys aren't planning on going commercial, in which case, no issue if you just wanna make games for fun. But I try to have a bit more of a business mindset on this channel here, and that was definitely one thing that I did heavily miss in this book. And then one last thing I really like, I'll zoom in on it, is Matt is an artist, so there are some really cool drawings throughout the book, some like nice charts. These are also the ones that you often see on, for example, his X. And I think they are a really good value add to making it more approachable. Because I've also read some indie game dev books that are just pure text based, like very dense. This is a very small and like compact and easy to digest book. So honestly, comparing to our previous book club book, I think I would pick this one more for a starting developer. This one is really more already focused on if you want to work with publishers. This is a really good entry into, I just want to make games and that's my main concern. So that was the main thoughts about the book. If you know of any books that you would like me to cover as well, let me know and maybe I'll cover it next month. I try to do these book clubs once a month and I think there's a lot of stuff you can learn from reading books. If this is the first video you see of us, we're game developers, we've released our own game before, we're working on our next games and we try to just give a very open look into running our own game dev studio, how does it work, what are the things that we encounter along the way, what are some struggles. So if that's something that interests you, if you want to make games maybe with a bit more of a marketing focus, be sure to head down below and subscribe as it really helps us out because we know that you like this kind of content and in exchange you get these videos twice a week. That's all I really have to say. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!